Good afternoon. My name is Eric Eikhoff, and I serve as the Associate Director for Alumni Relations at John Carroll University. Thank you for joining us for our second installment of our virtual scholarly luncheon. We're excited to have you join us for this opportunity to connect with one of John Carroll's outstanding faculty members. Over the course of the last year, the Office of Alumni Relations has worked to create innovative and interesting programming for our alumni, current students, parents, faculty, staff, and friends so that we can, continue, can keep them engaged with the university while we cannot gather together. Today's scholarly luncheon, just one more example of how JCU is sharing the expertise of its faculty, staff, and alumni with our broader community. Before I introduce our speaker, featured speaker, I wanna go over a few housekeeping items. Dr. McGinn has pre-recorded her presentation and at the conclusion of her presentation, we'll take questions uh, for her. Please use the chat feature to ask your questions and I will curate them for Dr. McGinn. I will hold all questions until the end of the program. We also encourage you to use full screen option so you can more fully enjoy the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sheila E. McGinn, PhD, our featured faculty member for today's virtual, virtual scholarly luncheon. Sheila E. McGinn, PhD, Northwestern University, 1989, serves as professor of New Testament and early Christianity in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at John Carroll. A frequent lecturer and author of numerous articles and books, her main areas of interest concern the development of the earliest churches, including dissenting movements, and of early Christian writings and their social and cultural environments. Her central, her central provenance for research is ancient Anatolia, and her range of works include commentaries on the gospel according to Matthew, the Montanist oracles, and the Acts of Thecla, a comprehensive bibliography on the book of Revelation, and studies on several letters in the Pauline corpus. She also contributes to the scholarship on engaged methods of adult pedagogy. Dr. McGinn is involved in service to the profession and in the wider church community. Among the roles, she serves on the editorial board of Conversations with the Biblical World and in leadership positions with the Catholic Biblical Association and the Eastern Great Lakes Biblical Society. Her most re recent works include the Romans Commentary for the New Re Revised Jerome Biblical Commentary, The Jesus Movement and the World of er the Early Church, and By Bread Alone, The Bible Through the Eyes of the Hungry. She currently is writing a social rhetorical commentary on the apocryphal acts of Thecla. Please join me and welcome Dr. Sheila E. McGinn. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Sheila McGinn. I'm professor of biblical studies and early Christianity in the John Carroll University Department of Theology and Religious Studies. I'm here to talk to you about an apocryphal story from early Christianity that is really fascinating to read and raises some fascinating questions for our contemporary times. So uppity women in early Christianity, evidence from the apocryphal acts of Paul and Thecla. Women were the unsung heroes of early Christianity. They played a central role in early Christian mission, yet the New Testament texts say little about them and almost never give women speaking lines. Apocryphal, that is non-canonical texts from the same early period tell a different story the central women characters who speak and act in ways we often think apply only to male disciples of Jesus. This lecture will focus on one of those apocryphal texts, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, also known as the Acts of the Holy Proto-Martyr Thecla, to illustrate an alternate perspective on early Christian women's contribution to the shape and spread of this movement. Their uppity behavior challenged the society of their own times and perhaps still challenges ours as well. The apocryphal early Christian story, The Acts of Paul and Thecla, introduces us to a short, stocky, bald, bow-legged Paul with a unibrow, coming to Iconium in modern day Turkey to preach, quote, the gospel of continence and the resurrection, unquote. With this lead off juxtaposition of testosterone and continence, the author clearly signals that questions of gender and virginity will provide key rhetorical frames for the tale. At least four of the 13 Beatitudes in the Acts of Paul and Thecla, particularly the last one, reinforce this focus on virginity. Verse seven dramatically shifts the scene to the maidenly Thecla, safely betrothed, ensconced in a window of her mother's house, so we can see that the tale also will concern female gender roles. Verse 8 sets Paul's preaching against Thecla's 
maidenly modesty, and we now have the basic parameters for the textual interplay between gender and virginity. This presentation will focus on the emerging structures of gender and virginity in early Christian discourse and the ways in which each category bends the other when the two are brought into mutual proximity. Apocryphal texts were written in the first centuries of the Common Era, too late to be included in the New Testament collection. Nevertheless, many of these documents were tremendously important in the formation of early Christianity. The Thecla legend shows that she was a folk hero during the first Christian centuries, and she became the most important pilgrimage saint by the fourth century. Western Christians have spent the last 500 years fighting over the Bible, so apocryphal texts have fallen out of use among them, but these texts were important throughout the Christian world until the Reformation in the West and still are in common use in the East. The story on which we'll focus today, the Acts of Thecla, originally circulated as part of first century oral tradition. It was written down about the middle of the second century and by the third century became incorporated into a larger collection called the Acts of Paul, in which it has come down to us today. Women such as Thecla say, played a, a central role in the early Christian mission, yet they've been the unsung heroes of that period. Scholars over the last two generations have begun to uncover the influence and significance of women like Thecla, challenging common preconceptions and repeated but outdated claims of ecclesiastical authorities. For cultural reasons, the New Testament texts say little about the women leaders of this period and rarely give women speaking lines. This was a protective measure to prevent leaving the women open to public abuse, but it had the unintended effect of diminishing our understanding of their roles for centuries afterwards. In the non-canonical texts from the same general period, however, we get a different story. In these apocryphal texts, Women disciples and evangelists play central roles. Female characters speak and act in ways that the canonical texts typically portray only of male disciples of Jesus. These non-canonical stories likely were told in house church settings, where women's leadership and discipleship were critical to fostering the Jesus movement. The material designed for public consumption to attract influential converts was designed to make Christianity fit Roman cultural mores that kept, quote, respectable, unquote, women out of the public eye. The in-house literature of early Christianity, on the other hand, demonstrates the liberty given to women disciples by Jesus himself, a liberty imitated among the early churches. Early Christian writers like Methodius of Olympus, Athanasius of Alexandria, and Gregory Nancianzus used Thecla as a positive role model for all Christians, especially because she is a proto-martyr. Thecla remains a very important figure in Eastern spirituality. The Acts of Thecla focuses on a wealthy young woman named Thecla. Maiden daughter of an aristocratic household, Thecla relinquishes that wealth and power to accept the gospel and become a disciple of Paul. Such uppity behavior challenged the culture of the time and led to negative repercussions from the wider society for those women who flaunted such cultural constraints. The text introduces Paul with a macho physical description, unibrow, bow-legged, shining countenance, features that were common to the Roman description of a commanding general. He comes to the city of Iconium to preach the gospel, here characterized as the gospel of continence and the resurrection. So we get this fascinating lead off juxtaposition of testosterone and continence, clearly signaling that questions of gender and virginity are going to provide key rhetorical frames for the story. The other characters in the story, Thecla's mother, her fiance, Alexander, the Roman officials, typically act according to the traditional cultural mores that are being challenged by the tale. We see this framework change, however, as the story progresses. Female characters in the story, even female animals, start to align with Thecla to defeat the power of Rome. 
Paul's preaching early in the narrative provides the motive force precipitating Thecla's rejection of her previous worldview and elite status to become a missionary for the gospel. Safely ensconced in the window of her mother's house, Thecla looks the epitome of maidenly modesty, yet Paul's message of the Christian ideal of the virginal life invades that safe, private household space through the open window, prompting Thecla's rejection of her privileged status, her fiance, her mother's house, and Greco-Roman gender norms to venture into public life as an itinerant missionary for the gospel. This novel set of Beatitudes, at least five of which emphasize the virginal life, signal the textual interplay between gender and virginity, emergent structures in early Christian discourse, which bend each other when brought into mutual proximity like this. The themes of the romance literature are mutated into religious romance. The story follows a standard plot line of the Greco-Roman romance novel popular in this period, a young couple whose liaison is opposed by parents or circumstances get separated for a long period of time and finally having uh, overcome insurmountable obstacles by divine providence or some other miraculous intervention, they get reunited and live happily ever after. Yet it's not Thecla and her fiance Thamiris who eventually are reunited. Thecla is wooed by Paul's spiritual beauty and falls in love with the gospel of continence and the resurrection. She repudiates her betrothal, vows a life of chastity, and leaves her mother's house not to marry Thamiris, but to follow Paul. Thus, the story uses the separation and reunification of Thecla and Paul as metaphor for Thecla's struggles to reach unity with Christ. Because she broke her engagement and vowed chastity, Thecla comes in danger of her life, but is saved by miraculous divine intervention. This feature is distinctive to the Christian romance, that those arrested are condemned, but then miraculously saved from public execution. The final blessing provides the key theme of the acts of Thecla. Blessed are the bodies of the virgins, for they shall be well-pleasing to God and shall not lose the reward of their purity. For the word of the Father shall be for them a work of salvation in the day of his Son, and they shall have rest forever and ever. The life of Thecla is used to illustrate how this blessing works and to entice the audience to imitate Thecla's choices. We survey the theological claims in the Acts of Thecla. We find parallel versions of Christianity, one being promoted, the other rejected as false teaching. That false version of Christianity conforms to Roman cultural mores, including gender norms and patriarchal marriage, whereas the true version rejects those cultural norms and replaces them with an egalitarian model of gender relations focused on detachment from this worldly values. This true Christianity frees believers, women and men, to live and preach the gospel. While we may find this stance odd by contemporary Christian standards, it has a firm basis in the words and deeds of Jesus, example, who encouraged people to leave behind parents and spouses and children to follow him, Luke 14, 26, and to become eunuchs for the kingdom, Matthew 19, 12. The Acts of Thecla argues that those who assimilate to Roman culture and adopt Roman values and gender norms will be condemned at the final judgment. Real Christians have to be wholehearted for God in Jesus Christ, following only God's will, not social custom, which means living the virginal life, like Thecla and Paul. This model of gender roles allows women and men to work together in the fictive family of the Christian community rather than following the natural family, which enthralls you in the pagan world. The Acts of Thecla comprises a doublet where the same basic plot line is repeated in two stories, one that takes place in Iconium and the other in Antioch. Story A focuses primarily on Thecla's rejection of her former life, while story B shows her new life as a Christian apostle. I've highlighted the Roman gender mores in purple, and Christian mores in red, that is Thecla's version of the Christian mores. 
As you can see from the highlighted sections of this outline, the gender dynamics are much more intense in story B, starting with the attempted rape of Thecla by Alexander while Paul stands by and does nothing, denies knowing her. This vignette parallels the conspiracy story in story A between Thecla's fiance and her mother, which fulfills Jesus saying that he came not to bring peace but division, Luke 12. 51. Thecla's fiance and her mother don't want to follow Jesus. They want to live a normal Roman life, and they aim to bring Thecla back in line. They accuse her as lawless for refusing to marry, and she's sentenced to be burned at the stake. Of course, God is on Thecla's side, so sends rain and hail to punish her persecutors and rescue Thecla from death. Once released from prison, Thecla is expelled from Iconium, she meets up with Paul on the road and cuts her hair short to become a traveling evangelist with him. Here's the first case of gender bending in that Thecla takes on a man's persona to accompany Paul on the open road. In story B, because Thecla fights the attempted rape in Antioch, she is arrested, charged with sacrilege, and condemned to fight in the arena among the wild beasts. Paul abandons Thecla, leaving town before her attempted execution. The townswomen, on the other hand, denounce the sentence as godless. This interplay between what the men do versus what the women do becomes even more marked leading up to and during the attempted execution. Queen Tryphena protects Thecla's chastity before the execution, and when Thecla is taken to be executed by the beasts, the lioness protects her against all the other male beasts. The women in the crowd decry this terrible sentence. Finally, in the audience, Queen Tryphena swoons and the governor stops the proceedings because he fears she has died and that there will be reprisals from the emperor if his relative dies at this execution. The governor has Thecla released, calls her the pious handmaid of God, and all the women praise God while the men remain silent. Thecla returns to Queen Tryphena's household, which we find is totally female. Thecla is so effective as an evangelist, the whole household converts, as do numerous youths and maidens from the town. After this successful ministry, Thecla leaves Antioch and is reunited with Paul, who belatedly commissions her to preach the gospel, there, thereby giving a masculine stamp of approval to her chosen role as apostle and minister of the sacraments. So the gender presentation in this text is far from simple. We see a really powerful woman, but she adopts masculinity to claim the right to act in the public sphere. She cuts her hair short and dresses in a man's cloak so she will look more like a young man than a woman. Her household of origin, which is all female, opposes her. Thecla's mother even conspires to have her killed. Her adoptive household, also all female, redeems the family image, especially Queen Tryphena as the mother. So the story displays why Christians assert that you have to leave behind your family of origin to follow Jesus and join his fictive kinship group, the family of the church. Story B seems to present a more straightforward portrayal of female power and authority, but even there we have some bending. The lioness sides with Thecla against the male beasts, and the women of Antioch side with Thecla against the ruling men, decrying Thecla's condemnation as impious and lawless. In that way, the text highlights the importance of women's roles and a female perspective on how Christianity should work female protectors and defenders controvert male decisions. Yet most of them still fit the traditional female roles. Queen Tryphena brings Thecla into her household to keep her safe, and they stay in this household sphere after Thecla's miraculous rescue from the beasts, which creates a contrast between Thecla's external public role and the other female character's internal household role. The Thecla story has some interesting parallels with other Greco-Roman literature of the time, especially the story of Hagnodice, the first Greek Roman woman physician, which suggests that women trying to break into, quote, forbidden roles experience similar types of hostility from the wider world and require women's support to break the proverbial glass ceiling. 
The story of Hagna Dice teaches the audience to validate women in a profession previously closed to them, whereas the story of Thecla validates women in a role they had been playing, but from which some second century ecclesiastical leaders were trying to exclude them so that the church would conform to Roman social mores. The Acts of Thecla re resists this cultural assimilation, celebrating Thecla as a role model of women's apostleship, sacramental ministry, and faithful perseverance in the face of martyrdom. Thecla remains steadfast and dedicated to the gospel, facing death with confidence in Jesus and free from fear. And God validated her faithfulness by saving her from the fire, the beasts, and the rapacity of men, nurturing her in the bosom of a woman-identified church so she can face the wider world with truth and grace. For those of you who are interested, here are a few extra readings that you might want to check out um, that have to do with the Acts of Thecla and also themes in the Acts of Thecla, things related to the Acts of Thecla. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, Sheila, thank you so much for your presentation. That was really, really interesting. And one of the things, I, well, first off, I would encourage anyone who has questions for Sheila uh, to use chat to answer them, and I will, I'll ask them on uh, your behalf. Um, one question I do have is, how did you first get interested in the Acts of Thecla and as an area of scholarship? Wow. I, you know, I don't even remember when I first, I think it was, I took this really great course when I was doing my graduate studies that was uh, called the History of the New Testament Era. So it was actually about all the Greco-Roman literature being written at the same time as the, what we call the New Testament was being produced. Um, and we read all sorts of well-known authors like Tacitus and Suetonius and uh, Apuleius, and we read satires of Juvenal and all sorts of other kind of fun things. But one of the, the texts that got introduced in that course, what I didn't, at that time, I didn't even know that there were apocryphal New Testament works. Uh, and so this was, uh, I forget if the Acts of Paul and Thecla was a specific uh, aspect of the course, or whether it was just the general concept of apocryphal New Testament literature that was that was part of that. Uh, <clears throat> but I followed it up because some of these, uh, I mean, you know, this is an hysterically funny story. You know, Paul's getting slammed every time you turn around. I, I mean, he's a Judas figure in that scene with Alexander trying to rape her on the street. And he says, well, I don't know her. You know, which means she's fair game, you know, do whatever you want with her. I mean, it's just so out, outrageous in, in terms of the way Paul is portrayed um, that that's sort of what got me started. And um, and so I've done a certain amount of work in other apocryphal uh, texts, but this one just has such fascinating gender dynamics. Um, <clears throat> That's kind of what got me hooked. And so you can you can hear throughout this lecture, I mean, the, the bigger project is this rhetorical analysis of what's going on in the story and why certain scenes are framed the way they are and how does this story influence, um, you know, the, the Christian writings in the third and the fourth and, the, and culture in, into the later centuries. Uh, it, it's fascinating that Thecla is still just a remarkably popular saint in the East and, uh, and also in the Coptic church. Only what's funny is that there in the Coptic church, they've turned her into a man. Uh, and, and so um, there's this whole gender bending thing is flipped, you know, so that instead of just cutting her hair short and wearing a, a different kind of cloak so that she'll look like a guy, um, which may be a safety feature. You're hitting the road and, you know, uh, and you don't want to look like you're vulnerable, right? Uh, <clears throat> but, but in the Coptic church, it's just totally because they can't imagine that a woman could be an apostle and play that role, right? So. <clears throat> yeah, I will say it, it did kind of surprise me um, to hear of Paul and kind of that, as you mentioned, a Judas kind of figure. Um, and then at, at the end that she goes back to him 
at, you know, after the, the, in the, the arena, he basically as a, for approval to go to become an apostle, right. That kind of, that, that did surprise me a bit. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a weird relationship that they put there somehow that he still has to validate that. Um, even though he refused to baptize her when she asks originally, um, and therefore she might have been validated earlier before she did all this, but now it's after the fact because she's shown the fruits of her labors, right? And so there's this early Christian theme about by their fruits, you shall know them and that sort of thing. And so she's been successful. So what can you say? It must be okay because God has approved it. Um, I think the other piece that's going on there is that um, this, this story is circulating before some of the letters that we have in the New Testament. Um, so even though this, the, the text is not written down until about the middle of the second century, the story Paul already knows about. Um, I mean, he mentions it in one of his letters, right? Uh, and so we know the story existed already, and we've got these letters in the New Testament that are trying to say women shouldn't function in these roles. So, and they are, uh, they're pseudonymous letters, but they take Paul's name, okay? So to have Paul validate her is a good way to argue against First and Second Timothy and Titus, which are the letters that try to say, no, women should, you know, should not do this sort of thing. They should stay home, right? Um, anyway, so I think that's why is that you've got to have um, a word from Paul to validate what's going on instead of making Thecla Rebecca renegade. Sure. Um, well, we got some questions in from our, our attendees. So the first one is, uh, the 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 person asking notice that you use the word apostle to refer to Thecla. Uh, do you think there would have been other women apostles, or or was Thecla truly an apostle as well? There definitely were other women apostles. Paul mentions Junia uh, in Romans sixteen. I think it might be verse six. Anyway, don't look it up. Uh, but anyway, in Romans chapter sixteen, Paul mentions Junia who's an apostle of note. So not just an apostle, but really well known among the other apostles. Um, that's a, um, a way of, of making a, a superlative form. <clears throat> um, and of course, ancient church tradition has Magdalene being the superlative apostle, right? Apostola, apostolorum often is translated apostle to the apostles, but Gwen Continengo can tell us that that actually that's a superlative Latin form because there is no greatest apostle word, you know, in, in Latin, that's the way you, you do it. So she was the first, she was the apostle to the rest of the, of the disciples, uh, but she's, you know, well known until there's a, again, a, a later backlash. And then, um, the most significant backlash against women apostles actually comes as part of the Reformation, uh, in the Reformation period, which is kind of fascinating. People usually think, oh, that was kind of a release period. It was really a bad period for women, for women's roles. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the next question is, uh, do you think gender dynamics of the story or the demonization of Paul ultimately resulted in this being declared non-canonical or do you think it was some other reason that it is non-canonical? I think both both reasons. Uh, uh, like in first and, uh, in first and second Timothy, they talk about old wives' tales and the danger of listening to old wives' tales, and that's why women are set are told to not that they cannot teach in a mixed audience, and what they can teach is the older women should teach young women to be submissive to their husbands and take care of their children and all these, you know, common Roman social mores, okay, keeping women in the private sphere, not in the public sphere and that kind of thing. So there's direct, there's this head on collision between the uh, perspective on uh, gender roles in the pastoral epistles as they're called versus what we see in Acts of Thecla, both of which have some foundation um, in the original Pauline texts. Um, but actually Thecla is, the Thecla story is way closer 
to what Paul himself says than the pastoral epistles are. Now, the fact that those got incorporated into the New Testament, there are, there are complicated reasons for why that happened, um, but it largely has to do with um, not just gender issues, but Romanization in the second century uh, in what's called Asia Minor in that period. Um, so modern, prim primarily modern Turkey. Um, <clears throat> So, so my mind then goes to, um, you know, if it wasn't, if, it, if it's non-canonical, and maybe this is a hard question to a answer, um, if it was, if it was included in the canon, what do you think the impact of Thecla's story would have been on Christianity? Well, okay, uh, just let me step back for a second. The question of canon uh, is really important to us today because of the printing press. Uh, Technology has created uh, has created the Bible, um, or has made the Bible function in a way that it never did before. Okay, um, internet technology is influencing that even more so, but we don't go there. Uh, in the ancient church, the only way you ever heard any of these stories is aloud either in church with somebody commenting on it or in someone's home again, with discussion about it, that kind of thing, uh, because first of all, most people were illiterate. Secondly, the people who were literate, uh, you had to have a, a lot of disposable income uh, in order to be able to afford to own a copy of the text. A few years back, one of the local synagogues had a new Torah uh, um, written for their 50th anniversary, it costs $40,000 because it takes nine months full time for a scribe to make a, a hand copy of just the Torah. Okay, so imagine what it would cost for the whole Bible. Um, and the Torah is roughly the size of about two thirds to three, maybe three fourths of the New Testament. Okay, so, you know, who could afford that, right? But then you get the printing press. And now what you get is a consistent list of books that comprise the Bible, because before, before the Council of Trent, there's actually no official statement in the church. There's no official statement that says, here's the universal canon of books that go into the Old Testament and New Testament, right? So 15, what, 1546? Ed maybe can help me out with that, the exact date. But anyway, middle of the 16th century, right? You finally get the statement from the, uh, from the church that says these are the books in the Bible. Previous to this, print copies of the Bible had come out, but now that's why we have a difference between the Protestant and the Catholic canon. It's because the, the previous edition had a different list of books. That's part of the reason why Trent responds, saying here's, actual, here's the right list, okay? Uh, Anyway, so previous to this, you heard whatever books were read in church, and some of these books were read in church. So it was lectionary that matters rather than canon. Um, if you didn't hear it at church, well, we, there are a lot of books from the Bible that we rarely hear, if ever, you know, in church too, right, that are not really part of the lectionary. I think we hear two chapters out of the book of Revelation because it's, uh, because it's, complicated. Um, and in the Eastern church, they don't read it at all because they think that it's a, a hidden book and we have lost the key. Okay. So, <clears throat> so there are books that actually appear in the canon that are part of the lectionary. Therefore, they don't really function in Christian life. But these extra canonical books have always been copied, have always been studied in the monastic communities and that kind of thing. So actually, to some extent, some of these books were way more influential uh, than actually the biblical books. When I was a kid, I went to uh, parochial school. We learned who Mary's parents were. Well, how do we know that? From an apocryphal gospel. Uh, we learned that Joseph was a widow, and that's why you have stuff about Jesus' brothers and sisters in the New Testament, because they were really half-brothers and half-sisters from his previous marriage. How do we know that? Because it shows up in an apocryphal gospel. Okay, so those books, those extra canonical books were just as influential in Christian culture as the canonical ones until people got so focused on actually having their own print copy of the Bible and they realized they weren't in there, right? So, so it's kind of, um, a, 
is there's a little bit of a time warp, I guess, for us, right? That, that if you think about what things were like before the printing press, there was a lot of leeway about what counts as quote canonical. In other words, what can norm Christian life? That's what canon means, right? That it provides a rule for life. Um, and it's only um, after the fact and, we're, and we tend to be, the technology tends to be, uh, you know, it, we miss, we don't notice it, right? We don't notice how the technology influences the way we think about these things. So it's actually pretty important to, to pay attention to the fact that canon's one thing, lectionary is another thing, but which books are valuable and which books are influential? That's a quite a different question. And, and the ubiquity of Thecla shrines, even today in the Eastern church, um, is really amazing. Um, so uh, it's still a very important story, even though people want to try to constrain it because, you know, we're not supposed to let women do that sort of stuff. Well, th thanks for explaining that, Sheila. I, I appreciate you doing so. Our next question um, talks more about Paul and the physical description of Paul sounds straight out of an ancient comedy. Um, I can visualize the comet mask that fits the description of him. Um, are we supposed to think of him as a comic figure in this work? I, I don't think so. Um, Robert Grant did a little essay, like, I don't know, might have been late 80s or something, uh, that talked about this description of Paul and how it fit actually all the, you know, in the handbook of rhetoric, you know, what should you say when you're introducing a Roman general is like bing, bing, bing. It's got five basic features of intro, including the bow-legged stuff, right? Well, Paul wouldn't have been bow-legged. He, he, he went 10,000 miles during his missionary work, but mostly he was on foot. You know, you have to actually be wealthy to have a horse. Um, but a general, on the other hand, is bow-legged because they're always on a horse, right? Uh, the unibrow thing is pretty funny. Uh, and so it does come across as a little comical, but I think it's because it's supposed to look fierce, you know? And, and so, uh, so anyway, I, would, uh, I can look up the reference if you're interested in the little essay by Robert Grant. But, um, <clears throat> but I think you're supposed to think of them as, you know, is kind of this macho important figure, even though he's teaching, you know, it's conflicted for a guy, right? You you don't want to be seen as unmanly when you're teaching about the virginal life, right? That's a little bit dicey, okay? So if you present him as this kind of uber masculine figure, um, maybe he has more credibility or something, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's a good segue into the next question. Um, from Ed Hannenberg, uh, he was wondering, can you say more about the emphasis of continence and virginity in the story? And then again, in early Christianity more, more generally. Sure, uh, the, that, uh, that one frame that says true conversion, false conversion. Okay, if you look at all the items over in the false conversion row, every single one of those shows up in the pastoral epistles, right? Uh, if you wanna be a church leader, you have to be husband of one wife. You have to prove, you have to be an aristocrat. Um, you have to prove that you can manage your money well, which means you got to have money. Um, you have to prove that your wife and your children are obedient to you. So, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. There's a, uh, and, you know, in church, in the Catholic church anyway, the tradition is uh, that now it is that uh, mandatory celibacy in, in the Western church. but but in these letters, it says, oh, no, 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 we're not having that. No, you, you have to be married. Now, you shouldn't be married more than once, right? Uh, but you have to be married. Well, it was part of uh, Augustus' uh, renovation to the 12 tables, his, his updating of the 12 tables. One of the things was the required citizens to be married by a certain age and, and women to be remarried if they were widowed too young and all that kind of thing. So all the items in that list, uh, and in, even a couple of the people who show up in the Thecla story show up in the pastoral epistles, only in the pastoral epistles, they're on Paul's side, whereas in the Thecla story, they're enemies. Um, <clears throat> if you want to, uh, if you want to look like a normal group in a Roman city or a Romanized city, even more so in the provinces than in Rome itself, 
you know, if you if you want to look like a group that's not uh, dangerous, right? That's not at least potentially challenging and that kind of thing. Uh, putting on this this show so that the or changing your rules so that the only people who interact with the public to represent your group are aristocratic men. That's a smart move. And the pastoral, the author of the pastoral says, it's so we won't get persecuted. He doesn't say it quite that bluntly, but but it's it's almost in those exact words. Um, it has to do with reputation, right? But you know that people have, uh, there, uh, there's, there's uh, correspondence between the emperor and the governor of Bithynia around a, a little bit before the pastoral epistles are being written. It talks about the torture and execution of a couple of ministri, women uh, ministers in the, uh, in the Christian community um, and what they found out and stuff like that. So, you know, there's at least, you know, occasional situations where people are executed because they're affiliated with the, with the church, the, the Virginia church. So anyway, there are good reasons for why the pastor wants to, uh, you know, suppress women's leadership, or at least, you know, keep it under wraps, you know, keep it at home, right? Um, there are, uh, it, it's weird because if you follow the arguments that the pastor uses, the, and instead of looking at the strategies that the pastor employs in order to substantiate those, uh, those dynamics, you know, it has to do with the gospel not being ridiculed, uh, with the church not getting a bad name, um, and also with people not getting executed. Now, in the contemporary world, we don't have to, uh, the whole issue of people do die for the faith, but it's, it's uh, at least as far as we can tell, mostly a sporadic kind of thing, not a constant, right? Uh, but in terms of what gives the church a bad name and what gets the gospel ridiculed by outsiders, it's not having women leaders. So if you follow his rationale, the strategies would be totally the opposite of what the pastor says. So the last question, and it's a, hopefully, hopefully it's easy one for you. We actually have someone who's asking about the background of, uh, that you have behind you, your, your Zoom virtual background. I know it's not. Oh, okay. Oh, what, fun. What, what, what's behind you right now? What's behind me right now is I couldn't find a, a version of Iconium, which would have been the, you know, the first town that shows up in this story. This is actually um, Ephesus, um, only it's been touched up with this virtual, uh, you know, coloring and all that kind of thing. So this is a restoration of what the, uh, what it would have looked like if you're entering into um, this Roman city of Ephesus on the coast of Asia Minor. So Iconium is, Cunha is, is a little bit south of Ephesus. It's not too far away. It, it would have been uh, structured the same way. And so what we see, if you go there in person today, all you see is plain white marble, right? But it's because the paint's worn off. Um, and, and so what you would have seen is this very colorful kind of street scene. And actually it probably would have had a canopy over a big swath of this because it gets freaking hot uh, in summer there with the marble uh, sidewalk reflecting back up while the sun's beating down. Um, <clears throat> and so anyway, yeah, so I thought it would be fun. It was a perfect backdrop. So thanks for <laughs> thanks for sharing. And thank okay. you so much for joining us today for our Scholarly Lunch. And it was wonderful speaking with you and having you share your expertise with us on Thecla and, and early Christianity. We really appreciate it. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> Before we uh, turn off, uh, uh, go away from the program, um, I have a couple announcements I'd like to share with all of you about some of other our upcoming programs uh, that you can join us for. Tonight, we'll be joined by Christopher Kempf, PhD, class of 2007, uh, and he'll share his most recent publication, What Though the Field Be Lost, a collection of poems which uses the battlefield at Gettysburg as a way to engage ongoing issues involving race, regional identity, and the ethics of memory. The conversation will be moderated by George Bulgar, PhD, professor of English here at John Carroll. On May 5th, we'll explore how electricity is at the core of all modern life. Author Craig R. Roach, PhD, class of 1972, will share his work, Simply Electrifying, which offers a comprehensive story of one of mankind's most important journeys, from a time when only a few could even imagine a world with electricity to today, when most of us 
to most of us, a world without electricity would be simply unimaginable. And then on May 17th, John McMurray, uh, MSJD, Chair of the Society for American Baseball Research, better known as SABRE, uh, the Dead Ball Era Committee and Oral History Committee, and lecturer in the Tim Russert Department of Communication, will focus on Larry Doby and his baseball legacy. Doby in, uh, integrated the American League just a few short months after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. While Doby's story is not as well as known as Robinson, he undoubtedly faced many of the same hurdles and hardships. It should truly be a fascinating discussion. You can find more about and register for all of these upcoming programs, including our alumni author series, scholarly lunches, our alumni continuing education series, and our alumni spotlight events at jcu.edu backslash alumni. Additionally, we invite you to uh, view the recordings, just like this one, as, and our previous programs on our JCU Alumni Association YouTube channel. To view our extensive library, search for John Carroll University Alumni on YouTube. Finally, please consider a charitable gift to John Carroll in support of our students, our outstanding faculty like Dr. McGinn, and our entire campus community. If you have already made a gift this year, thank you for your generosity. And if you have not, please join me in supporting JCU so we can continue to deliver an outstanding education for our current and future blue streaks. You can make a donation by visiting jcu.edu backslash give. Thank you again for joining this, us this afternoon. Take care, be well, stay safe, and onward on. John Carroll.